Hello everyone, my name is Raiz Pasha. Welcome to today's webinar titled Cloud Native Streaming SQL using Rising Wave or Pulsar. It's a mouthful, but uh, I think we have exciting content today um, as part of the webinar. First, I want to thank all the attendees for your interest in learning how stream processing can advance um, data processing capabilities. In today's session, we're going to learn about two of the leading open source stream processing technologies, Apache Pulsar and Rising Web. First, uh, customary housekeeping items. Uh, we're using Zoom for this webinar. Um, we have muted the uh, you know, microphones for all attendees. However, you can still ask questions using the Q&A tab as shown in the, at the bottom in the Zoom menu. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so you will, will email you uh, the link as well as the copy of the slides that are presented here. And then finally, if you have any questions with Zoom, um, you can use the chat button to reach out to the organizers if you have any um, logistic issues with, with Zoom. All right, so today, uh, before we go into the talk, I wanted to... Uh, start with a quick announcement. Uh, today's webinar happens to be the first in the series uh, of a new series that we are launching for streaming stories. To expand on why we launched this series, I'd like to give a little bit of context on the current streaming uh, stream processing market. Um, as you may all know that um, there is a consensus forming over the value of stream processing. Right? Stream processing is no longer a niche, uh, but it's becoming a necessary tool to uh, gain competitive edge for businesses. Stream processing technologies have a rich history, but they've been around for a decade. Um, but there's a clear change that's happening in, in, the, in the market in terms of use of stream processing to solve business problems. And why that's happening is because businesses are no longer satisfied with knowing what happened in the past. Um, rather, the new use cases are all about predicting future outcomes. Um, that requires analysis of data in real time. And this is a natural fit for stream processing. Right? By design, stream processing allows for exploration of data that has short shelf life. Um, a lot of these cases where data may not hold value, using uh, batch processing doesn't work. So we clearly have a market, market need. Uh, we need to propagate the knowledge about stream processing so that we can nurture the community. With that intent to foster you know, wider and greater engagement with the community. Rising Wave Labs has embarked on this new initiative called Streaming Story. As the name suggests, this will be a multifaceted uh, dialogue. Basically, we want to keep it both ways so that it's not just presentations coming from, from ours. Um, we, we want we invite all the data practitioners to come together, discuss, and present the latest challenges, opportunities in the streaming space. Um, obviously, as from the logistics perspective, um, we, this will be run on a bi-weekly cadence. Um, and the topics will include product-focused meetups um, where you know stream processing tools and technologies will be presented, something like what we're going to do today. It could also include panel discussions, which are more around challenges and opportunities that are there in streaming space where uh, thought leaders can share their insights. Uh, and lastly, also technical deep dives. These could be pure technical topics where we would bring in engineering leaders to solve specific data process problems that are there and how streaming would help. So if any of these, um, if you are a streaming enthusiast and you wanna learn more, contribute to the community, please consider joining our meetup group. Um, the link is posted on the slide. And also you can take part in our discussions in the Rising Wave Slack community space. So thank you. All right. Next, I wanna talk a little bit about the presenters which introduce uh, ourselves. Um, from my side, I'm, rising, uh, I'm the head of product at Rising Wave Labs. Um, I, have, I have deep expertise in database management and speed processing technology. I started out as an engineer working on database optimizer and then moved on to product management role. And I've had product management roles at startups and big companies both. Um, previously I've held uh, we have all the Tiagraph, Workday, Hitachi, and HP. And I have a master's in computer science from University of Montreal. Joining me today is 
Tim Spam, uh, developer, principal developer advocate at Team Native. Team, would you please introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah, I'm developer advocate at Stream Native. Uh, I've done a lot with different streaming data, worked at a number of different uh, companies like Cloudera, Hortonworks, Pivotal, HP. Also have a master's in computer science from a small state school. And uh, I've been covering NIFI, Pulsar, Kafka, Flink, Spark, all kinds of fun stuff for the last six, seven years now. All right. Thanks, Tim. So let's switch over to Tim, uh, Tim to start the first part of the presentation. I'm going to stop sharing. Tim. Perfect timing. Hopefully you could see my uh, screen here. Uh, sometimes it's a little uh, weird. Yes. I've got up. We, Very yeah, good. I get, I get, yeah, I can look up. yeah. I wanted to introduce my colleague here. Uh, David is the expert in Pulsar. So I'll uh, hand off to him when uh, things get into the real deep, uh, deep end of the pond there. Yeah, he's a committer and wrote a really awesome book. At the end, we've got a link to it so you can get a free copy of the entire PDF of the book. Really awesome stuff. You want to say hi, David? Hi, David. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank I you, Tim. I didn't know you were going to do that. I really knew that. <laughs> So I wanted to, because this is a discussion of the future, I wanted to show a couple of uh, things here in an eye chart that I made hopefully somewhat visible. Up at the top, looking at uh, Pul Apache Pulsar, awesome way to get data streaming about, and we'll cover that in depth. Two main vendors there, Stream Data and Data Stacks. Next up, a little more commonly used, but not quite as powerful is Apache Kafka. As you could see all the logos there, a lot of people are doing that. Next up, Apache Flink. Again, uh, pretty big, a lot of people using it. It is uh, moving forward really well, nice project. And then down there, we only got one vendor for one of my favorite projects, Apache NiFi. It's got connectors to all these different systems. But what else is important in streaming? Well, you need to get to your data via SQL. Uh, Rising Wave will go into that. There's a couple other vendors in there. It's a very rich area. I see a lot of different uh, ways to do that with some variations. They're all really good ways to do it. Uh, this is in the future I see, those are probably the three strongest out there. And then the people supporting these other projects, these should be the big ones for the next five years. Uh, on the app space, obviously, Flink and some of the other tools have application uh, ways to access this data. So does Tiny Bird and uh, my friends at Hazelcast have some interesting ways to uh, connect to these. And I'll show you at the end a little example. You can really use a lot of these together. So it's not all, all in on one thing. You know, you need a data hub for messaging. That could be Pulsar, it could be Pulsar and Kafka, it could be Pulsar and Kafka mode. You know, you may need some NIFI to get things into the stream, get things going. Lots of different ways. Any Anything on these charts is, is not a bad way to do it. You're not gonna, you're not gonna go wrong if you pick uh, some of these technologies and put them together. First up, I wanted to show a little bit of background on that guy that only had one vendor there, Mr. Apache NiFi. Uh, that's to build data flows, mostly for data ingest, movement, and routing, which is important. So you're not trying to do that in something that's better for doing SQL analytics or doing real-time processing or joining together data. When you want to grab all kinds of weird data, grab them from different places, do some basic cleanup and get them moving into the different uh, streaming messaging hubs. NiFi is the way to do that. Guarantees you get the data, buffers it, prioritizes it, uh, lets you control how much throughput and latency you want, gives you a full data provenance and lineage of all your data. So you know every piece of data that's gone through the system, you could track it, great for auditing. You could also use that data as live data. So I could take that provenance data about my data and make that streaming data, and I could push that to rising wave 
or another SQL analytics tool and you could do, you know, real time analytics on the data about your data, which will produce more data. And then you could push that into another thing. And you see how we could just infinitely loop that through there. Uh, NiFi has hundreds of processors to do things, very pluggable version control clustering, all the things you'd expect to have in a modern programming tool. What's unique about NiFi and a little separate from some of the other tools is it can also work with data that you might not think of in a streaming or moving context, things like binary data, unstructured data, image data, obviously tabulate data coming from tables and databases, but things like an image, uh, a PDF, a Word document, a zip file, weird uh, compressed data, secure data in some kind of weird secure binary format. Lots of different data, we can move it around. If you don't wanna to touch it, that's fine. It's a good way to instrument your data. Like for me, I'm grabbing it from a device I have here that's taking thermal pictures and I'm grabbing that pictures and ingesting them and sending them downstream to other things, grabbing some metadata from them, push them into uh, Kafka or the Kafka protocol into Pulsar. And then that can be used for, you know, live streaming applications. We get this data and I can enrich it. Uh, I could do this all visually. I could do simple event processing. David could probably spend five or six hours on the difference between simple event processing and complex event processing and, you know, where they overlap. And there's a lot you could do there. For me, the, the simple part is just do basic changes on one stream of data at a time, you know, one Pulsar topic, one Kafka topics worth, one stream, you know, one line of sensors, one line of logs at a time, get them into a stream and then someone else downstream can join them together, enrich them, do that really interesting complex event, uh, things that they're doing, whether that's in SQL or in code. Uh, NiFi supports all the modern protocols, so I can get data from anywhere to any place with whatever protocol. Obviously, support for Kafka and Pulse are getting that data in and out, so I can get take data from a Kafka cluster, do a little uh, cleanup on it, push that to Pulsar, vice versa, do uh, multi-chain those things out in any kind of uh, operation that you want. Could run on your laptop, but could run on a you know. 500 node cluster if you need to, runs in a standard mechanism of clustering. At some point, like everybody else, they'll probably get rid of Zookeeper, but we'll see. Uh, etcd can be used for some configurations if you're running, uh, you know, uh, K8 anywhere. That's the first part. This is the part that uh, it's a little more interesting. You may not have heard of Pulsar, but if it was everywhere, we'd be in the future. <laughs> It has some superpowers that uh, have made it uh, really powerful and easy to use. Uh, used for any type of messaging, and David could dive into that. I think I have a slide on that, what we mean by that. Guarantee you're not gonna lose your messages. They get where they're going. Systems resilient, things can die and the things keep going. You don't lose data. Scale up and down as big as you need to one place to put every type of message. This is very helpful. I don't know if you want to walk through this slide, David, or you want me to do it. I think this is a yeah, good I can, do it. For you. I can do it, Tim. Yeah, so thank you. So what, what this slide here shows that Pulsar is a very dynamic system. It supports both uh, a dynamic or a, a multitude of messaging protocols. We can speak to our native own Pulsar messaging. We can also talk to MQTT protocols. So existing MQTT clients can publish directly to Pulsar. Same with AMQP, which is your rabbit, and in the existing Kafka applications, as Tim has mentioned. So if you have existing legacy applications that speak Kafka, you can just transparently swap in uh, Pulsar, and it's and your applications really don't know the difference because we implement the low-level protocol. On the consumption side, we support different, uh, what we call subscription types that allow you to implement different messaging semantics. So... Those of you coming from the Kafka world would be most familiar with the failover one. The second one there, that is one consumer per partition. That allows that sort of limits your, your scalability uh, in that regard. So we uh, implemented the key share, which allows you to have guaranteed ordering across keys. 
but have any number of consumers that you want. So you get the full uh, uh, guarantee of message, uh, total ordering of by keys across the topic, but you can fan out as many as you want. At the bottom are the traditional messaging cues. When we, when we decided to write Pulsar, we said, why make everybody, why, why make people choose between streaming or messaging? Why don't we have a system that does both? Similar to what we did with, you know, AMQP and Kafka. Why have one, make them choose one protocol? Why not support all of them? And so with the messaging, again, we have the, the shared there at the bottom, which is your traditional work queue. Uh, everybody's, uh, everybody gets a subset of the messages. You can scale out infinitely to process data quickly if there's no stateful processing required, or you can have the exclusive traditional fan out model there, which is everybody gets a copy of their own message. So we really are very versatile with, with, with what we support from semantics and protocols. And I'll hand it back to Tim. Yeah, th those are pretty uh, impressive things. When you think about it, being able to get messages from, say, a legacy app that you may not want to rewrite and get that into your modern stream, this is a great way to onboard data from existing apps without having to add extra layers. They call in to their ports that they've been using already, same host name, same port, topic names. None of that has to change, but on the other end, it transparently gets into Pulsar, which can be read by, say, uh, Kafka. So you could have a Kafka app or a system that only knows Kafka right now. You know, read that and you don't have to worry. Oh, now I've got to make a copy of it. Now I've got to translate it to something else. You know, what, uh, you know, how do you do that? It makes things a lot easier. And the Kafka protocol is kind of a standard at this point. It really should be taken over by uh, maybe a separate messaging regulation body, but it's through Apache, so that's all good. It's a nice way to do that. You saw on that chart, there's a lot of people support Kafka protocol. It's a good way to get your data in and out of different things. Now, if you have agreed that your data has a format, it's structured, should really have a schema, this makes everyone happy because I know it's in the right format for the different SQL tools out there. I know that it's easy for anyone to pick it up, whether it's for a Java client, C, C++, Python, Rust, uh, NiFi, Spark, whatever you're using, everyone likes to have a schema. What's nice with Pulsar, that schema registry is built in and supports all the major ones that people typically use, Avro, Protobuf, JSON, Lots of options there. What's nice with Pulsar that's flexible if that needs to be extended. You know, very easy to do that with the open source. And you don't have to worry about running some extra server. This just handles it for you, regardless of if you're using a Python app or Go or NiFi. Just does it for you. Really nice feature I like there. Again, with streaming and open source. It's really nice that the whole ecosystem can work together really well, like we showed you in some of the other things, you know, NiFi, Flink, Spark, uh, very good ways to get things processed as well as Rising Wave. Uh, a feature I didn't touch on, uh, another way to do lightweight stream processing or simple events is with uh, Pulsar functions, you know, run event at a time, very powerful way to enrich data as it comes into the system. Pretty easy to code. Does a lot of the uh, boilerplate for you, very nice. Ton of syncs here again, whether you're using the different protocol handlers to get your data in, or you use a source to get your data in from various data sources. Great way, once you get it into Pulsar, distribute it to everyone who wants it and uh, do that at uh, any scale, very nice. This is not a complete list. There's hundreds of connectors, lots of other uh, systems in here, but this gives you a nice overview of some of the big ones out there. Nice way to do that. As I mentioned, NiFi before, that connector, you happen to have the author on the call here, thanks to David. Uh, he wrote this really solid. It's a nice way to get data into Pulsar and get it out of Pulsar real easy. And it's uh, supported by Cloudera and Stream Native, so you could be happy to use that uh, connector. I use it for a lot of uh, demos and such because so easy to use NiFi, so powerful to do uh, Pulsar. And uh, I'll maybe show a one-minute uh, 
little slice of a demo just to get you a feel what we're talking about and why you need more than one tool here. And here I'm leaving this empty because once it's in Kafka or Pulsar or it looks like Kafka, you know, the next talk is going to be what you can do with uh, Rising Wave. But first, you got to get that data, get it in there. And you're probably not putting the binary data into uh, Kafka, but uh, you could. <laughs> you just, I, I wouldn't recommend it. So what we do with NiFi, this is NiFi running. This is not uh, a diagram of the code. This is taking data that I have from uh, a live thermal camera, which uh, if I could see my 20 screens here, uh, it's just reading and waiting for data off an SFTP port. When it comes in, starts processing it. NiFi has the ability to process images, grab metadata from them, also send them places like, uh, as you saw in that uh, diagram imager, which is a public hoster for images. And I could just send them out there. And here I could do uh, live queries on the metadata for that data. So as that data comes in as JSON data, I could do a query on it, maybe looking for certain terms, just a, a feel here, pretty simple. And then when I'm done, you know, we have all that metadata here. It says that it got uploaded. It uploaded my, uh, my GIF here from uh, my live camera. Let's see if I could paste this in properly. I'm not good at pasting. Let's see if it worked. Yeah, that's me. That's my head. The camera's right next to me. I guess I'm warm. The jacket's cooling me down there. But just to give you an idea that this, this stuff does work. <laughs> it's, it's pretty uh, pretty simple too. And you can do all kinds of data. Getting it into Pulsar or Kafka is one step. Comes in as records. Every week I talk about all this stuff and I put it in my little newsletter. And I cover all the cool tech for my friends at all those companies you saw, all those different projects, sample code, slides. I'll have links to uh, this video in there once, once we have it cleaned up and ready. Uh, links to the slides, links to the code, everything that we have there. We've got a live link here to uh, David's book, which is very awesome. Much, I guarantee you will enjoy reading it covers a lot of cool topics, is a very complete book, full PDF, click there and you can download it, be good to go. I've been Tim, you can connect to me there. Uh, I don't know if we wanna do questions or hold them to the end or uh, go right into the next talk. I don't know if we've uh, thought of that yet. What do yeah. you think? We can have the question, if there are any questions at this point, we can ask them. I mean, are there any in QA channel? Let me see. Yeah. I do see one. Uh, David is check. typing it in, but does it support all the major programming languages? It supports a lot of programming languages. I would say all the major ones and a lot of minor ones. I mean, I guess that's a debate. You know, if it's your language, it's major to you. But, you know, Java, C, C Sharp, uh, Python, Rust, Go, Node.js, and the the way around maybe not support for you know maybe you have a new language like Carbon or you've made your own language. It has support for Web Sockets and Stream Native has support for REST. So whatever language you are, you could just use that very uh, open protocol to do it. And don't forget the power of Pulsar is that we it supports all those different protocols. So if you can't find a Pulsar client library for uh, your particular language, which is a bunch here, you could use one of the Kafka libraries or the MQTT library or AMQP or Rabbit library or WebSocket or REST. One of those has your thing there. But again, I think that's pretty close to most of the major languages listed there with Scala and Rust and Node.js. I think that covers it. Don't see any other questions. We want to uh, switch over to the uh, next talk and then me and David yeah. will be on for more chat. All right, thank you, Tim.
Thank you, David. Thank you. Start I'm going to grab the screen. Sounds good. Okay. You guys can see my screen? Yes. Looks good. All right. Okay. So let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, this is the second part of the presentation. Um, focus more on the streaming databases. And also, I'll be talking about the high level overview of uh, Rising Wave system. We'll start with the concept first. Uh, followed by high-level architecture. Uh, next, we'll look at some industry use cases that are good fit for streaming databases. And finally, we'll look at the key features that we that enable these use cases that are uniquely uh, positioned to solve these use cases. All right. So before I go into the into the features themselves, I want to quickly start with the a larger context of why, how streaming databases come to uh, a inflection point at this point. Well, obviously this talk doesn't have anything to do with search. Um, I'm just using search as a way to example, to illustrate the point that when a new technology trend comes up uh, and it's ready to go mainstream, it needs an inflection point. It needs a market need or an innovation as a trigger to make that happen, right? In the case of search, uh, the early implementations were pretty rudimentary. Um, there was a real need, but it needed innovation. And that's what Google provided. Right? Google provided innovative technique on to how to organize data, information present to the user. And this made search really easier and ubiquitous as you know now. Well, how did that happen? It happened because the way search was done prior to Google was much different than uh, what Google brought in, right? Traditional search techniques were relied on batch, uh, the you know batch process that loaded the results in a web store, and it needed to be updated periodically. Um, what it resulted in is slower performance, and the results reflected um, the time when the data was loaded. So it was not meant for. Uh, it had a lot of value, but it had limited applicability beyond a certain point. Now, when Google came, they saw that market that search could be much more than what was available at that time. And the techniques they used in terms of how the information extraction was done, how the indexing, uh, the data was indexed and how the results were stored in a database. So a lot of those, you know, it, it takes, it's, it'll take a lot more to explain, but the larger point I was trying to, I'm trying to make is that Google basically was still a, a search engine, but because of the techniques and all, it really made it much more mainstream. So you could use it on a daily basis. Now, how does that tie in with um, with our coming to the data processing space? How does that uh, change, right? You know, we're looking, we are at a similar inflection point, I believe, when it comes to data processing. There's a lot of innovation happening in the data processing space. Traditional approaches have all been about batch processing techniques, right? They, and they've been there, they've served well for a long time, for decades. But there are new architectures that are coming on uh, with the focus to move to a stream processing model. And these uh, techniques will allow us to address new and emerging use cases. And, and, and how we do that is like traditionally data pipelines have relied on an ETL process where incoming data comes, it gets informed, it gets stored in a relational database. In this case, as you see, it's a Postgres SQL database. Users will typically query the data using SQL. It's all great. It works well, it has worked well for a long time. But the real problem here is that the time it takes for someone to prepare the data and make it available for application serving is long, right? That's the problem. And this would, and this is, and this is not a knock on the existing architecture, but it's just the way the built-in latency that is needed for different stages to prepare the data, it takes time. And as a result, you have to live with that latency. Now contrast that with the, streaming database like Rising Wave, where there is a paradigm shift, right? That you're basically moving your database functionality upstream to enable processing of the data in transit as it arrives. And what that allows is that you don't have to wait. Uh, the data serving can happen without any delay because of the fact that we don't have all the built-in latency. And streaming wave database like Rising Wave, you know, they're all, they are addressing that market need. They are, there is a new need, emergent need. We almost have to educate uh, market that there's a better way to do processing and streaming is not just a niche but can become mainstream. You can build real-time applications, uh, you know, 
and and writing where our any streaming database can talk to any system right? for example any message queue like pulsar or any other data sources to cdc you can uh, talk to them do the transformation to simple sql the net result is a system that is allows you to address all of the limitations that you have with traditional batch processing without having to learn a new system without learning new apis or anything. so in a way we are at that inflection point where we can have best of what the traditional batch processing offered with the shortcoming removed based on that so if you go a little bit deeper it's not just about uh, streaming databases right streaming databases are only part of this new emerging uh, scenario we need a cloud native message queue as well in this case that's the reason why i want to highlight also right because we need a message queue and the data streaming database to fuse together the data integration and serving layers. The integration and serving have been disjoint and that's caused for the latency. By having systems that are cloud native built in, that are compatible, we can provide end-to-end -end data pipelines in SQL without low level, without the knowledge, without requiring data engineers to have advanced knowledge of the low level API. So from a perspective, you're looking at a unified architecture that not only does the streaming part, uh, the transformation and the serving all together in one solution. And obviously this allows for better concurrency and the cloud native aspect allows you to scale the resource as needed. For a, de for a developer, they don't have to learn about the underlying complexities of the architecture. All they need to know is SQL and they still Code SQL, and you still get all the benefits of this, you know, instead of having to worry about creating complicated data pipelines. And in this case, uh, I want to highlight the fact that from Rising Way, we have a built in connector for Pulsar. And to add to what Tim was saying, all of the data sources that you use uh, to pull into Pulsar as a single source, all of those sources will, in fact, be easily ingested into Rising Way because of the fact that. Also happens to be the plumbing, um, you know, conduit for us to bring in all the rules. So let's go in a little bit deeper into the architecture itself, right? Rising Web is a cloud native architecture. And if you want to talk about the features, you want to talk about the high level uh, first principles that went into design of Rising Web and streaming database. The first thing you start with is the engine itself. Um, Rising Web engine is uh, is a is a native brand new design from scratch engine. It's not a bolt-on implementation of another system that we took on. Right? Um, and it's built purpose built for streaming uh, workloads. And we've written that in uh, Rust in a high performance Rust for the security and for performance reasons. And performance is a is a is a is a is a very important aspect of streaming because of obvious latency reasons. So Rust helps us there. And then the architecture itself is an event-driven architecture. So because the, a lot of the use cases that stream processing used with is the data freshness. So you need to really, uh, the quick turnaround response time has to be quick enough that you could get the value out of the data. So from that perspective, the architecture supports sub-second data freshness. And then third thing is the state management, right? State, streaming workloads have unique requirements of how you manage state. And the, and the engine uh, is architected to support that. The next part is the platform itself, right? As, a, as I mentioned, it's a cloud native platform, which means uh, the, the system can be horizontally scaled. As, you, as the workload demands increase, you can add more resources, which means basically the data gets out of partition and you, you can horizontally scale the system as, as you need. And in this case, it's not just the scalability, but the elasticity of it so that you can scale the compute resources as needed and, and shrink them back when you don't have workload needs. And second principle is the separation of compute and storage. From the get-go, uh, Platinizing Wave is designed to independently scale compute and storage. Like if you have data, enormous amount of data, but you typically deal with a subset of data, then you can have a much smaller footprint on the compute side while you can still maintain long history of data on the storage side. And then the last one is the ecosystem. And uh, the ecosystem is clearly the, one of the most important things 
uh, for a database system, right? Because you have to interoperate with the the source, the the system that are up, upstream as well as downstream. In this case, we have uh, we have upstream support for source data from all of the major uh, message queues: uh, Pulsar, Kafka, Amazon Kinesis, Red Panda. Um, we also support via CDC a lot of the sources that are um, any of the uh, database systems, and we also support uh, object stores where you can bring in the data and and uh, uh, and and integrate easily. And similar, similarly for syncing the data downstream system, that could be BI tools, could be other uh, database systems. We can easily push the data to data lakes and data warehouses. And all of this supports. Uh, we have we are we are compatible from with Postgres SQL, which means any application that's written for Postgres can be automatically ported to uh, Rising Web without doing a rewrite of the application. Which means anything that um, you know Postgres is kind of becoming the new standard when it comes to SQL. So from that perspective, we we have an open ecosystem. So. At a, at a high level, the architecture, there are multiple layers. To start with, we have a serving layer, which is the layer that a client will interact with. We have a system, we have a services called front-end services that kind of do the session management, account management, all of the uh, client-facing activities. And once the uh, client request comes in, it gets pushed to the processing layer where the compute nodes reside. And, and that's where, based on the complexity of the job, the degree of parallelism that's involved, the right amount of compute is uh, used for that particular job. And then we have separated, as I mentioned, the persistence layer from the processing layer. This is the separation of compute and storage. The persistence layer for the long-term dur durability of data, we use object store. Um, we support S3, GCS, other, uh, all the leading major cloud vendor uh, storage um, uh, media. And then once the data is stored, we have a separate compactor process that allows data to be uh, rewritten and, and if there's any fragmentation in the data, it's take, the compactor takes care of them. And on the right, we have the meta server. This is sort of the metadata stored that manages permissions, security, uh, monitoring, um, all of the uh, kind of the brain, the control plane, if you will, uh, for the system is managed with the meta server. Um, this is the high level architecture of the system. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the use cases, right? Like there are a number of use cases that are excellent fit for streaming databases in general. We'll start with the first one, which is anomaly detection. This is a very common use case that we have seen. Um, and, and typically, you know, in financial uh, trading companies, they they, they want to issue instant alerts when a stock price, uh, stock price goes up or down dramatically so that the traders can take immediate action. Now, this is one of the Achilles heel for data processing systems where the time it takes to respond to a spike uh, may not may not fit well with the architecture constraints of a back processing. With rising wave, you know, users can monitor trades and trades efficiently with just simple SQL. And they can track the trends in real time to real time dashboarding capability that we have built in. And we can not only track prices over the long term, can also predict based on that. And there's no need to create any complex data pipelines. Um, streaming databases, they, the reason why they can, can do that is because streaming databases recompute results. As a new data arrives based on the source data, we recompute and then any uh, required business uh, action, uh, say a, a trader has to take can take based on the business logic, which is can be written in SQL. So when, say for example, if you have alert you want to set up and that requires some premeditated action, you could code that logic in SQL. And as the new data comes in, it automatically recompute and that action will be taken. So from a perspective of uh, a user, this is not some system that is giving you analysis, but actually giving you real time insight and take business decisions based on that. And additionally, for, for, for users in, in such low latency environments, uh, developers can use the built-in serving capabilities that are in the system to really uh, look at what is scenario. 
based on the data that previous data they can look at some ad hoc winning to see how if they were to change separate some parameters in their business logic what would results what results would happen right? this this allows you to this is not only a system that's for real time analysis but also can go back and do experimentation and see how they can fine tune their business logic so in in a in a way this system covers both your past and the and uh, you know business processing requirements the next uh, use case that i want to talk about is the recommendation system recommendation systems are like widely used to select the relevant content for users. And this is used for um, you know, streaming like Netflix services or any uh, advertising and other uh, industries. But the real world recommendation system face the challenge um, that you have numerous microservices that have to work together in a complex data pipeline. So you basically have a, um, and these are really multi-level uh, uh, services that we are talking about. In this case, Rising Wave can really help by replacing the whole pre-processing pipeline. And part of that multiple levels is that the, the pre-processing that has to happen before an action can take. So in this case, Rising Wave can replace the pre-processing and manipulate the in-flight data with simple, elegant um, SQL queries. And here in, 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 in Rising Wave, we have built-in support for what we call materialized views. Which, which are basically an abstraction layer on top of the um, underlying SQL. And you can have multiple levels of MVs. So you, you, what you have, you may have a complicated data pipeline that could in fact be turned into a simple MV, right? Materialized view that will call. And when a new data comes and these MVs get automatically recomputed. So what you have, what you had like thousands of lines of code could just turn into a simple, few simple, SQL queries. And maintaining a state is also quite simple because you don't have to worry about having these microservices talking to different stores and coordinating state. Since all of this is within Rising Wave, which is a database and consistency is, is one of the key features of our database, we will ensure that the state is maintained within the database itself. Next use case is um, related to real-time advertising analytics. And in this case, um, he, again, another uh, use case that illustrates the power of strip processing. Um, you, here, for example, what we have is a real time is a, is a campaign that a real time campaign that a advertising company is running. It's as simple as that, right? If you if you want to run this campaign using a um, scripts, you will have to see how many. Uh, you will probably have to run a large program. In this case, you all of this like if a if a advertiser wants to track their ad impressions and monitor what is the click-through rate. All you have to do is write a simple MV where they collect the number of clicks, the number of what, how many of those impressions they've been able to uh, click through. And as simple as this kind of program, a simple metalized view will give you that insight into, and this could be running on a, on a system where as, as, a, as the users come in and look at uh, the impressions and clicking through, the real-time dashboard will auto-populate the results of the effectiveness of that um, advertising campaign. And we provide a wide range of SQL functions like aggregations, time window functions that allow that where you can customize based on your business need, how uh, you want to track the, um, uh, the effectiveness of a, of a campaign. So here's the third, this is the third use case. Now I want to switch the gears a little bit and look at how the key features actually are, you know, what key feature, how those uh, key features can enable us to support those unique use cases, right? First is the cloud native tiered storage. Now, native sto tiered storage is something that we, we it's part of the, any cloud native architectures, right? Um, but the, the tiered storage allows in two separate ways, uh, add advantages to the, to the from our streaming database perspective one, it allows us to store historical data in a much lower cost object store or even a cold storage format while we retain the most recent data in the local storage. That way, the system itself makes the determination based on recency on the workload needs where to put the data. And this really allows us to keep the footprint small for compute resources because one of the big drawbacks of uh, back processing systems, if 
especially ones that store data natively on the on the servers themselves, is that as your data size increases, you will you will end up having to host a lot of this high, uh, very expensive um, compute resources. In this case, because of the separation, we can really keep the footprint small. And in this case, uh, we also have dedicated compaction jobs that allow you to really compact the data. Like we have a lot of fragmentation in the data that could also cause problems. So by having the compactor run periodically based on how burst your application is, you can really cost, keep the cost low. The second thing is the workload management, right? The workload management is another key feature. In the streaming context, it's a little different from the typical workload management. In legacy database system, workload management is concerned with ensuring that the concurrent jobs have a, a throttling mechanism so that they can enforce rules. Um, in the case of uh, streaming databases, that is required all as well. But uh, besides uh, making sure the resource utilization rules are at play, but we also have to ensure that the incoming data coming in from message queue doesn't overwhelm the streaming database workload themselves. So in this case, like for example, if there is an occasional spike in the data coming from pulsar load, we have built in uh, back pressure mechanisms in the database that allow us to throttle and stop consuming data if needed so that we don't uh, overwhelm the system. So from a workload management perspective, if you are strictly running a real-time application and um, if you see occasional spikes in your application because the users are there's a large number of users are if you misconfigured your uh, cluster the system will take over and will ensure that the service does stay alive that we don't run into some out of memory or other um, errors and then the next one is the um, automatic schema mapping so this one is is kind of a, a, one of the big challenges that we see uh, when it comes to gaining real uh, insight from data is the ability to transform the data in real time, right? Typically, a lot of the time that's spent in that is with the ETL process, with the data preparation. And for the new use cases where the latency is very short, the system should be able to adopt more ELT approach as opposed to ETL approach, right? Um, to do that, the database has to have native support to convert data coming in from different, in different formats and different sources. In the case of uh, I think where we have a uh, number of uh, capabilities to do the automatic schema mapping. For example, if you have data coming in JSON, protobuf, or any of the formats, we can convert into relational data with very little uh, effort. Uh, the built-in support, it lowers the cost from a data engineering perspective, so you don't have, your data engineers don't have to spend time, resources to actually um, do the conversion on their own. They can use the SQL directly. Um, means obviously they don't have to maintain custom scripts. And and also the second part is the fact that it, it you don't have to involve another system for the ETL, uh, all of that. So from our overall cost of the solution perspective, overall the cost kind of goes down. And then the last one I, I want to talk about and the key features is the, uh, the consistency aspect, right? Consistency and security of data is of paramount importance. So when the data is processed in, in batch processing, if a job goes wrong, you reload the data and then you address the issue. In the stream processing case, that's not possible because your real-time stream keeps coming, right? You don't have that luxury of going back and replaying the, the log. Um, it, that's why it's very important that the streaming database provide you guarantees uh, in terms of consistency and uh, making sure that the, the data that is processed matches the upstream and downstream system. In the case of Rising Wave, we, we have a checkpoint-based check system mechanism that allows you to that that allows you to uh, provide those strong guarantees. Every time a checkpoint is triggered, the internal states will flush to the cloud storage so that we have guaranteed durable data uh, that we can go back and read, reread read if you need be, um, if something were to go wrong, right? And this is really important for mission critical applications because um, as a database, we have to stand by the, the strong consistency guarantees that are required um, by the application. So that's the last key feature I had. Um, so let's see if there are any questions at this point.
Brona, you see anything? No. Okay. Um, well, if, if there are no questions, then I really want to thank everyone uh, for attending the talk. I know this is the first one. I hope we folks who attended can attend our future uh, webinars too. And I want to thank Tim and David um, for the inaugural streaming stories. Uh, any other, any comments from you, Tim, David, before we wrap up? I, I see one question out there. Okay. It, it's for Rising Wave. It says, since you mentioned that Rising Wave has a SQL serving layer, what is the difference between Rising Wave and databases like Pino and Druid? They are streaming plus SQL as well. So Pino and uh, Druid are more OLAP centric databases uh, for longer, uh, you know, for larger data sets, more, they, they claim to be real time, but it's not, their architecture is not even driven architectures. They're not meant for sub-second latency. It's uh, from a data um, transformation perspective, but they do um, offer unique capabilities in terms of OLAP functionality for larger data sets. Um, that would be the ba uh, basic um, difference. The architecture is also quite different because um, as I mentioned in the streaming databases, we process the data as it arrives. Here, they store the data and then pro uh, and then the serving capability in a more traditional manner. Very cool, good to know. All right. Okay. I think we are pretty much at the end of the presentation. Thank you again. Thank you.